Just a quick question, are, are we, is it not going to be working then for the remainder of the service? Okay, I'll bear that in mind as I'm quoting. <laughs> we usually put up the scripture quotes uh, but, uh, and any lengthy quotes that I might have. I happen to have one this evening, but hopefully we'll be able to follow along. Okay, well let's, um, let's go ahead and turn. We usually have a scripture reading for the, the, um, the text that we're looking at as well, but if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. And uh, what I'd like to do is read verses 28 through 34, and I think if you've read your Bibles very much, if you've read uh, the Gospels, uh, this is going to be one of the most familiar passages uh, to us. And one of the reasons, of course, is because it's repeated in just about all the Gospels, certainly in uh, three of them. Uh, it is having to do with the greatest commandment, and we want to see why it is the Lord actually calls us to this level of devotion and affection to him. So let's uh, just simply read Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34 to begin with, but we really are going to center mainly on verse 30. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well asked him what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered the foremost is hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, right teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. I keep hearing this going on and off. Is it um, it's not an attempt to get it running again? Okay. All right, well, hopefully it won't be too distracting. <laughs> Sometimes electronics can be a great blessing and sometimes they can get in the way. So, looks like tonight, well, okay. Well, what we want to talk about this evening, of course, what we want to see is the importance of being devoted to the Lord. You know, it, it struck me as I was, I think it was when I was coming to work um, yesterday or the day before, get the days mixed up. You know how people like to express themselves through bumper stickers, the back of their cars. I remember one time going to Santa Cruz for the first time for a meeting uh, of the church over there and being cut off on the freeway. As soon as I got onto the, the freeway, I was cut off by somebody who had some anti-Christian stickers on the back of, of their truck. Um, one of those Darwin fish eating a Christian fish and some other things that I won't want to repeat. Well, as I was coming to uh, work this week, I saw somebody else who had all these bumper stickers plastered on the back of their car, all of them anti-Christian. And it wasn't hard to see where their commitment was, what it was they were devoted to. And that is, of course, they were against religion and in favor of atheism. Well, we need to have, of course, devotion to the Lord. A devotion that really takes us out of, if I can use this terminology, though it's been somewhat polluted today, out of the closet and not just be closet Christians. We need to be open Christians. Uh, we need to have that kind of love and commitment to the Lord. And I think that's what we see in our text this morning, what it is the Lord is, is excuse me, this evening, what he's calling us uh, to do. Now, we are looking at a very familiar command, one that our Lord tells us sums up absolutely everything that the Lord requires in his word. Now, Jesus says specifically in the law and the prophets, that is in the Old Testament, but I think it's equally true today, what it is that he desires of us today. Uh, this is really what he was aiming at when he sent his son into the world to save us, namely this, that we would consecrate ourselves to him, that we would be devoted to him with our whole hearts. 
that we would separate our affections from this world, from every sin, from every other pleasure, whether, of course, sinful pleasures, but even those which the Lord gives to us as good things, if we become too devoted to them, as we just sang in one of these hymns. Um, you know, take that idol off the throne, whatever it may be, and let me be devoted to you. We need to be devoted completely to the Lord. Now, I do believe this is closely connected to what Paul called us to do last week in another very familiar passage in Ephesians 5.18, when he says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. We saw that what Paul meant there was not to be filled with the desire for this world, not to be under the control of sin, or even those things that God gives to us that he means to be blessings to us, but we are to be filled with the Spirit entirely under his influence and his control because when we are, we will devote all the powers and faculties of our soul to God's glory, to do his will. Now, this is really what the Lord has always wanted, and this is what he continually says throughout Scripture. He said to his people in the Old Covenant, in Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8, You shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I, the Lord your God, uh, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The idea of holiness is being set apart from the world, set apart from sin, set apart from really everything else to give ourselves entirely to the Lord. The Lord says, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He says the same thing to us in the New Testament. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, your being set apart from everything else and set apart entirely to me. He says, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16, as obedient children, do not be conformed to your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You should be holy, for I am holy. Now again, we're going to want to see what it is the Lord is really talking about here. This isn't, as it were, putting the screws to you or putting the screws to us, basically forcing us to be something against our will. But it's basically the Lord gives us a spirit to change our will so that we would desire to be this way. And unless we actually desire this with the kind of love the Lord calls us to, we're not going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. Clearly, the Lord wants us to be devoted to Him. Now, this is what we want to think about this evening because of the very strong connection between our devotion to the Lord and our effectiveness in reaching others with the gospel. Because if we are not devoted to the Lord, we won't be devoted to His work. And if we're not devoted to His work then we're actually going to accomplish very little of that work in our lifetime. And this may be the reason why we haven't been able to reach more people than we have uh, with the gospel is because we lack this devotion. We can't have a divided heart. The Lord wants the entirety of our hearts. So understanding that we are to devote ourselves to the Lord and his work, let's consider what he actually calls us to, what the level of devotion is to which he calls us. Now sadly, some evangelical churches have reduced 
what the Lord calls us to do or what he wants from us down to simply knowing the gospel and believing that the gospel is true. Basically, if we've heard the gospel, we believe the gospel, we've gone forward in an altar call, and we've prayed the sinner's prayer. That's, that's basically all we need to do. That is all that God expects. But we know that isn't true. I mean, look at what Jesus just told us in this text. He wants us to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just believe the facts of the gospel, not just believe these things really happen, but trust Jesus alone for our salvation. He wants us to turn from our sins and be holy, separate ourselves from sin, and separate ourselves to his service. He wants us to do whatever it is he tells us to do. And of course, what he tells us to do is always good. It is always right. It is always the loving thing to do. The Lord wants us to follow him wherever he leads us. Now, how often does the Lord want us to do that? I mean, is it enough to come to church on Sunday and to give him uh, the, you know, one or two worship services? Uh, are we going beyond, as it were, the call of duty if we throw in a midweek study and, and go to a prayer meeting or add personal devotions from time to time? Uh, I think we understand the Lord wants us all the time not just part of the time. He doesn't want just an hour here, an hour there. The Lord wants uh, every hour, every day, every second to be his. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 16, not to waste time, not to squander it on things that really don't matter. He says this, therefore be careful how you walk, be careful how you live, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. In another translation, it's, it's redeeming the time, buying that time up. Uh, Jonathan Edwards once said that um, time is so precious that all the money in the world, all the wealth of the universe could not purchase one more second for, you know, for us, for our lives. And he says, he also pointed out that, that a person who comes to the end of their lives and are not ready to die uh, would give everything that they could just to have a few more seconds of time, but, but they can't. Sometimes we have to reach that point in our lives before we really understand how precious time is, but we need to see that now. It's precious now. We need to buy it up, and we need to redeem it, and we need to give it to the Lord. He's the one who gave it to us that we might use it to serve him. And then we ask the question, how much effort does he want us to put into following him does he want just 10 percent does he want 30 percent 50 percent well obviously he wants 100 percent he wants the very best that we have to give him and i believe that's what jesus is telling us in this passage in his answer to the scribe's question about the greatest commandment what is it that the lord desires from us more than anything else well, basically, he wants this level of devotion. He wants us to love him with this kind of love because it is going to give us the power we need to do everything that the Lord calls us to do. Jesus again says in Mark 12, verse 30, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. By the way, he also says, love your neighbor as yourself. He's not saying our exclusive love to God is going to cut anyone out. Uh, but basically, we are to love them for his sake so that in everything we do, we are doing it out of love for him. Now, John Gill, who was um, an expositor, I believe, from um, the UK back during the days of Edwards, did a good job of summarizing what Jesus means here when he writes this. And I hope you can follow along because we don't have it on the screen uh, to see basically a paragraph. He says, In regeneration, that is in the new birth, when the Lord causes us to be born again, when we are quickened to life, when the lights come on and we love the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him, when God puts his laws into our hearts and writes them in our minds, Love is produced in such persons to God the Father who has begotten them again according to his abundant mercy. 
and to Christ who has saved them from their sins and to the Blessed Spirit who has quickened and comforted them. And this love is in some measure exercised as it should be and is here directed to with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is, with all the powers and faculties of the soul or with the affections as under the influence and guidance of the more noble faculties of the soul, the mind, the understanding, judgment, and will. And if you didn't get any of that, get this last point. And with all your strength, he says, which answers to the phrase in Deuteronomy 6, 5, with all your might, that is, with the greatest vehemency of affection, in the strongest expressions of it, and with all the strength of grace a man has. That is how we are to love the Lord. We are to love him with every faculty of our soul, with all of our affection directed toward him, to honor him and to glorify him in every possible way. Now, we know that when something takes hold of our hearts, and sometimes it can, even to this degree, sadly, and not be God, but when something like that happens, whether it's a person or a thing, all of our attention focuses on that thing. Everything in us conspires together to get that thing or to hold on to that thing, whatever it may be. It's all we think about. It's all we want. Well, that is how the Lord wants us to love Him. Now, when we look at the church today, and if we just step back and look at ourselves, is, is that what we see? Do we see that kind of love, that kind of devotion to the Lord? Uh, well, I, I think we'd all admit that that kind of love is rare. We have seen it displayed in some people throughout history, but how many of us today would say that we possess this kind of love? Now, if we're Christians, we do have it in some degree, right? We have the Spirit of God living in our hearts, and He is producing this kind of affection, but we also know there are many things we can do to weaken that work and to quench and grieve the Holy Spirit so that He doesn't express Himself in us in the way that the Lord calls us to allow Him to, to give us this kind of love. But clearly, this is what the Lord wants from us. He wants it because he's worthy of it. I mean, look at all that he has done for us. Look at all that he is. Look at who he is. He is worthy of all of our love, all of our affection, and certainly in saving us, in creating us and saving us, he deserves it. But he also wants this from us because he knows without it, we're not going to be able to do what he calls us to do. We're not going to be able to break out of the discomfort zone, as it were, and reach out to other people. He wants us to be able to say with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.14, as, as Paul expresses his own heart and why it is he does all that he did. And we'd have to admit he's the kind of person that the Lord wants us to be like. Of course, Jesus is, is the perfect example. But Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. What is it? that motivated him. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. He was controlled by that love that our Lord is calling us to in this text. Well, I think we understand that. I think we see the connection between love and devotion, what the Lord calls us to do. But the important question is, how can we love him like this? How can we love him more? How can we be more devoted to him? Well, We've answered that question several times throughout uh, the several years, but let's just review it again. We do need to understand that this doesn't happen automatically. You don't just kick yourself into autopilot, just cruise along. It's not going to happen if you don't do anything because this work is a work we have to be involved in. It's something where we work together with God to work out this sanctification. Uh, nor does it happen quickly. And that's very sad, uh, although in some instances it might. It takes time and it takes effort. Now we also need to understand that it is first and foremost a matter of 
the heart. And what I mean by that is this, is that God can command us to love Him in this way. And certainly, He does command us to love Him in this way and to be devoted to Him in this way. And by the work of His Spirit in our souls, we can obey this to a certain degree. But if we want a greater devotion, we have to have a greater love. Now, we can try and force ourselves to do this. We can try to force ourselves to give ourselves more to the Lord than we are now. But I think you understand that if you have to force yourself to do it, that that kind of effort usually ends in failure. The problem is we're fighting against ourselves in order to love the Lord more. We, we do have corruption still in our souls. We have sin that we have to deal with. We are not 100% His. The only way to win the battle then is to change the direction of our hearts. To focus all the streams of our affections that are flowing outward to various things, focus them all on Him. Now that's easier said than done, isn't it? But it must be done. Now, this is one of the reasons why we have been studying revival, actually, uh, in the Wednesday study, because we know that when the Lord sends revival, He pours out more of His Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit of God is, is, as it were, more available. There is more power of the Holy Spirit, and His people experience that, and they become more consecrated. They become more devoted because their love for Him increases. Well, that is exactly what we need. But sadly, the Lord isn't always pouring out His Spirit in revival like that. And I say sadly for us, but we know the Lord has His plan in doing it when and where He wills. But there's another thing we need to understand, and that is that we don't have to wait for revival in order to grow in our love for Him. It's easier during a revival because there's more of God's Spirit available to us in a revival but there is something that we can do right now. Something along the lines of what we looked at already last week and of course beyond. And that is to free ourselves from these other loves. Remember Paul says, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the control of the things in this world. Well, how can they exert any control over you? Well, the way they do it is by gaining your affections. Your heart goes out to them. You want them. And to the degree that you want them, to that degree, they have control over you. Well, Paul says we need to free ourselves from the control of everything that is sinful and even everything that God may have otherwise given to us to be a good gift. I mean, you can come under the control of things that are even good uh, we mentioned a few of those things before I mean even even um, uh, alcohol is given for a good reason and if we use it appropriately it's a good thing uh, food is a good thing but again we can misuse it there's so many things God gives us as good gifts that we can become ensnared by we need to make sure we avoid those things too and we need to be filled with the Spirit of God we need to be under the control of the Spirit of God now how do we gain as it were, more of that influence. But we're going to just take a slightly different tact and look at it this way. This morning, I think I already mentioned this. Why do we have devotions? What, what's the purpose of a devotion? Well, we think it's to express devotion to the Lord, and certainly it is. I mean, we, we're spending time with Him, we're expressing our love to Him and our devotion to Him. But there's another reason why we have devotions, and that is so that our devotion to the Lord will increase so it will grow that's why we read the Bible that's why we pray or at least one of the reasons I mean we certainly want to know what we are to believe and what we are to do but this is also spiritual food that the Spirit of God takes and feeds our souls and strengthens us with his influence it is to build us up in God's love now, if we are doing these things only because they are our duty to do them, you know, I, I believe I have to read the Bible, so I'll open up the Bible, I'll read my chapter. There, I've read my chapter, I've done my duty. I need to pray, so I'll pray, and I'll ask for what I need, but then I've done my duty. If, if we do it that way, we're not really going to benefit from 
from these means by which God actually strengthens us by His Spirit. We need to be involved. Our hearts need to be engaged. We need to let these things affect our hearts and build our love and devotion for the Lord. By the way, I should also mention, if you don't feel like reading the Word of God, if you don't feel like praying, and there are days when all of us will experience that, it is our duty still to do it. And perhaps the Lord will give us grace as we do our duty and stoke some of that love more into our, into our hearts. But we are doing it primarily to grow in our love for the Lord. That's one of the main reasons why we meet together for worship. We, we do meet to give God a sacrifice of praise. It is our duty to worship Him and glorify Him, but it's what we want to do. And as we meet together and sing these hymns of consecration and read of these examples in Scripture of those who actually gave themselves to the Lord in this way, and as uh, we're, we're being called to do that very thing in, in this passage of Scripture and, and hearing this again explained and applied, the whole purpose behind it is that we might be more devoted to the Lord, that we might be encouraged to love him more, that we might encourage also one another through our fellowship to love him more. And that's also one of the reasons, a very important reason, why we get together midweek to study and to pray because the Lord uses this to strengthen the work of the Spirit of God in our souls and so strengthens our love and our devotion for the Lord. The more time we spend with him, thinking about him, meditating on his love, on his mercy, serving him, the more we're actually going to love him. And the more we love him, the more we will devote ourselves to him. Which is why the Lord calls us to be worshiping him, how often? All the time, right? Not just meeting together to worship all the time, but our lives are to be a continual act of love and devotion and worship to the Lord. Again, Paul writes a very familiar passage, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And by the way, that's why when we do these things that we're doing, why we need to focus on letting these things affect our hearts. We don't want to do them just to say we've done them, but we want to do them with the goal of increasing our love and devotion to the Lord. So this is what the Lord calls us to. This is the level of devotion he calls us to. And we've seen that um, this is how we gain more love uh, by using the things the Lord has given to us in order to increase it and not just treating the Bible or these things as might treat other books uh, and so forth. It doesn't really matter whether I understand it. It doesn't really matter whether it moves me or not. We are to let these things move us and work in our hearts to increase our love. But finally, we need to understand that unless, as I mentioned at the beginning, unless we are devoted to the Lord in this way, we're not going to be able to accomplish very much in our lifetime of the things that really matter. And we do need to understand that even if we devote our lives completely to the Lord, there's, there's, it's still very little compared to everything that needs to be done in this world. We need to do this, but unless we are devoted to the Lord, we're not going to be able to do these things in the way we should. Now, we do need to believe that these things that have to do with the gospel and God's kingdom are the things that really do matter, that they are more important than anything else. We do need to believe that other things that we may be pursuing, though they may be important in their place, are not as important as this, such as you know, our education, that is important, of course, but not as important as this. The work that we do, the house that we want, the car we want, relationally what we want to see happen in our lives, those things are important, but they're not as important as this. 
These things that I've just talked about aren't really going to matter that much on the day of judgment unless, of course, they get in the way of our love and devotion for the Lord. And if they do, that's when the Lord says, well, they've got to go. Even as, again, we sang a little bit earlier, whatever it is, Lord, that's taking away my love and devotion for you, tear that idol off the throne and sit there again and let me love you most of all. We don't want these things to get in the way. We have to believe the things of the Lord are the most important things in life and the only things that are really going to matter on that day. I think on that day what matters is how much we love the Lord, how much we devoted ourselves to His cause in reaching the lost with the gospel, in equipping them, discipling them, and Sending them also into the work, the kingdom of God. That's all that matters. All these other things that God gives us, which are good gifts, are only meant to help us do this. Reach out to others with the gospel. Build up the kingdom of heaven. When we get sidetracked with other issues, it can become detrimental unless we keep this one absolutely central. Now this, as I've said, is the end. This is the purpose of everything we've been looking at this particular month, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit of God so that we'll have a stronger faith to be able to see that what God says in His Word is true and it's important. The Spirit of God also gives us a love and desire for these things so that we might love Him more and devote ourselves more fully to Him so that we might do the work that the Lord actually calls us to do in loving our neighbors as we love ourselves by reaching out to them with the gospel. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Love, love him in the way he calls us to love him and that will of course give us the kind of character we need to reach out to others, to our neighbor in the hopes of their salvation, saving them from judgment so that they might be with the Lord uh, forever. Unless we have the level of love and devotion the Lord calls us to, I, I really do not believe, and I think you know this to be true as well, that we're going to be willing to pay the price to do this kind of work because it is difficult work, and it's becoming increasingly difficult with all the litigation going on for all the different things that when well, a Christian stands up for a biblical principle and you know, somebody, you know, so many people are sue happy. And of course, there's always that, you know, the, the ribbing that you're going to take, the, the uh, shunning, the ostracizing from uh, the groups, that perhaps, of people you work with and so forth. It doesn't have to be that way, but sometimes it happens. We know that there are going to be people who don't like us for sharing the gospel with them, right? It's, it happens, but we have to be willing to do it anyway. And in order to be, have, to be willing to do that, we have to love the Lord in this way. That's why he commands us to love him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and with all the strength we have to love by his grace and, of course, to love our neighbor as ourselves. So may the Lord grant to us this grace and may he show us clearly how it is we need to achieve this grace, how we can grow in this grace, and may he grant that we would do more than just know about it and desire it, but actually pursue it to try, as it were, to focus all of our love and affection on him so that we would be devoted to him in the way he calls us to. Well, let's bow for a few moments in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do this.